Hello, I'm sure that everybody can eat while I talk. Um, and I'm Rhonda Lair, former president of the Osmond Surgical Medical Society. And I am so happy to present this lunch talk today. And I want to thank Heather Healison, our wonderful president, for her openness to have something a little bit different today and something that's very dear to my heart, which is animals that I've loved since I could remember loving anything. And uh, t today we're going to have Dr. Frank McMillan, a veterinarian from Best Friends Animal Sanctuary, speak. And if you look at his poster out front, this is a man that I think shows and wears his big heart on his face. So I'm very delighted to have this kind, wonderful person. And I've had the experience of going to Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. Um, my girlfriend, Nancy, who I'd like to come up. Just come up by my side, Nancy. Um, this is a woman that cares. She's a special educator in uh, Ogden and then has spent, since she's retired, her time helping injured animals, feral cats, um, the whole adopt animals that need to be adopted, and um, her spirit really shines through. So I'm going to introduce the two speakers today. First, we'll, Dr. McMillan will come up, and then uh, Linda Weiskopf will come up and tell you about the practical uses of animal-human interactions, which is how we kind of got this, because uh, it is medical, and animals are used in our fields. But I also think that animals should be loved and appreciated for their very own being. Um, so, and I want to thank Heather, because now this is, I'm going to rename the society the Ogden Surgical uh, Humane Medical Society. <laughs> um, Dr. Frank McMillan is the Director of Wellbeing Studies at Best Friends. How many of you have been to Best Friends? It is a magic place to take yourself, your significant other, your children. It's an angel valley, and I hope that um, Nancy will say a few words, because she's married to Anthony, who's here with us today, too, who's one of the founders of Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. This is so important to me, I am speaking slowly. Um, anyway, Dr. Mil McMillan was in private practice in Los Angeles for 23 years and was clinical professor of medicine at Western University of Health Sciences College of Veterinarian Medicine. Uh, he's the author of the textbook, Mental Health and Well-Being in Animals, and it's out there for sale. And um, I'm a psychiatrist, and we didn't have a psychiatrist this year, so I consider this in my purview. And, you know, animals have the same emotions and responses and needs that we do. So we'll learn about that um, today in part two. Uh, and then David and Linda Weisskopf, who I had the pleasure of sitting next to last night at Heather's honoring reception. Uh, they, are, uh, they raise volunteer puppies for the Canine uh, Companions for Independence and are currently raising their fifth puppy. And I think you've met some of them and their um, animals today over this last three days. Uh, they are also volunteers for Intermountain uh, Therapy Animals, which Nancy knows a lot about as well. And they take their therapy dog, Kara, to assisted living play, uh, situations and help the uh, people that are residing there. And Linda is a retiree, and David is a prosecutor, her husband, who helps her with this for Ogden City, and he can always be found with a dog at his side. So, just, just I want you to meet a spirit and soulful animal lover, Nancy Tevedal. Well, I, I had a nice little speech all prepared for you, but Rhonda said it was too long, and so now I'm going to have to wing it. And um, so I will tell you that as a special educator, I've had the pleasure of having animal therapy dogs in my classroom, working with my special needs children. Um, I'm very familiar with the canine companions for independence, and they really do offer a great life filled with independence for adults and children who otherwise would not live a life as fully as they do with these animals. Um, with my work with Best Friends Animal Sanctuary um, at one of our Strut Your Mud events, I met the wonderful Kathy Kloss, who is the director of Intermountain Therapy Animals. And through that introduction, I got a border collie named Stella, who was wild as anything you could imagine. She was like a kite on a string. But once she had on her little red scarf and she walked through a hospital door, she calmed down and she was the best dog that you could ever imagine. People loved and adored her. Um, in addition to my um, being affiliated with Best Friends as a volunteer, um, I've come to know about Frank McMillan, Dr. Frank McMillan, and maybe some of you are familiar, I'm sure you are, with the, the Bad News Kennels that our friend Michael Vick had up and running. I want you to know that um, out of the 47 dogs that were taken from that compound, Best Friends received 
22 of the most difficult cases. And it was under Dr. Frank McMillan's direction that these dogs are and have been successfully rehabilitated. Many of them are in foster homes, forever homes. In addition to that, there is one of the pit bulls that is serving as a therapy dog in a cancer treatment center and spends time visiting with those patients who are undergoing infusion. And um, if you haven't seen Dogtown on the National Geographic Channel, try and catch some reruns because it's all about best friends. And you'll see some of the, what we call the victory dogs down there now. So thank you. And I am so lucky to be here talking to all of you healers. You fixed me up plenty of times, I'll tell you that. Even from pit bull bites. But that was my fault. <laughs> Um, thank you um, for having me. Uh, thanks for the invitation to come here. And uh, <clears throat> thanks to UMA Financial Services for sponsoring the talk. I almost didn't make it here. Um, I drove up from Kanab. Kanab, if you don't know, is like uh, we're, we're right on the Arizona border. And it's about 350 miles or so, and I'm driving my Jeep. And right before I left, there was a little warning, warning light comes on the dashboard. So I'm thinking, oh, this is great. So I pull out the manual, I look, and it says, um, you know, it just get your car looked at. There may be something wrong. It's as vague as vague can be. So I said, okay, well, that's not bad enough. So I get on the road, and I'm driving, and um, after about four hours, another warning light comes on. It was kind of like Apollo 13, you know, when, when all those things went off. Um, and this one was red, and this one looks like a thunderbolt. Um, so I knew that had to be bad. So I pulled out the manual and you know, while I'm driving, and I, I read through that, and it goes, there's something wrong with your car, um, and uh, have it looked at. Um, if you can't have it looked at right away, it'll probably ride rough, whatever. I go, okay, well, that's not bad enough, so I'm still on my way here. And I finally get to Ogden, and um, they put me up at the Hampton right here, and um, I'm pulling around the corner, go into the parking lot. I pull into a parking space, and right as I'm pulling into the parking space, it was like 10 smoke bombs went off underneath my hood. And it just, I just, I jumped out of the car because I thought, okay, it's going to explode. Um, and uh, I looked underneath, and there's just this orange. I've never seen orange liquid come out of a car, but this one did. And it's just pouring out, and I'm thinking, oh, God, this is great. So anyway, I'm here. And my car is right in the shop right now, um, hopefully with not real bad news, but at least I made it. So anyway, it was nice. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, obviously what's up here, and that is um, how do we help back and forth across the species lines. Um, Linda's going to talk a lot more in depth um, than me um, about uh, some of the work that's done. I'm just going to cover a lot of the stuff, I won't say superficially, but just less in depth than her. Um, so we'll start off, hopefully, there we go, with um, how do humans benefit uh, from animals. Now this is a pretty broad topic and I'm not going to cover everything because obviously I'm not here to talk about how police dogs help solve crimes and all that kind of a thing. I'm going to talk, uh, obviously, what's of interest to us here in the room, and that's the health-oriented type stuff. Well, the first type of help is the human health and happiness, satisfaction, pet ownership, health benefits. Then there's the service or assistance animals. And then lastly, there's the animal-assisted interventions, which you can break down into animal-assisted activities and animal-assisted therapy. And the lines between these aren't cut and dry, but I'll help you understand it as we go along here, and, and Linda will um, further elucidate that too. Um, we'll start off with the human health and happiness. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is the obvious thing, and that is that we love our pets and we get a lot of love and satisfaction and uh, feel good from them. Um, I want to talk more about some of the science um, uh, that we know and that's about the uh, health benefits. Um, a lot of you may know of this, and that is the new research that's showing how good dogs are at sniffing out various forms of cancer, um, and there's a lot of good news here uh, to come, not really clinically applicable to its full degree. Um, 
but uh, sniffing out all forms of cancer, bowel cancer, bladder cancer, mammary, ovarian, um, just a lot of different things that dogs can pick up on, and of course it's because of their uh, sense of smell. But let's look at the health benefits, because this has gotten a lot of news um, uh, over the years. Um, there's been quite a few papers published on this. This is one uh, by actually a buddy of mine who collaborates on some of my research, James Serple at Pennsylvania. Beneficial effects on pet ownership, uh, of pet ownership on some aspects of human health and behavior. There's effects of hem animals on human health, promotion of human health, and health enhancement and uh, companion animal ownership. So these papers um, are just a small uh, uh, bit of what's been uh, coming out over the years. This is one that just appeared recently, just picked out as, as an example, and that is children with a dog in the room, in the home at age of one had a significantly reduced uh, risk of uh, eczema at, um, at age four. And also dog ownership also conferred protection against becoming allergic to cats. Um, oddly, the cat issue didn't work the same. If, if they, at one year, if they had a cat, it not only didn't help, but it actually made things worse. So, for what that's worth. Anyway, just to run through this um, uh, sort of briefly, um, this all started back in 1980. Erica Friedman at uh, University of Pennsylvania published a study on 92 heart attack victims and found that those who had pets were nearly five times more likely to be alive a year later than those without pets. And since then, there's been a lot of research along these lines. Elderly pet owners without immediate medical attention coped, be coped with stressful life events better when they had a pet. Pet ownership was associated with better physical and mental health, fewer visits to a physician, and fewer medications involving problems of blood pressure, sleep, cholesterol, or heart problem. Pets are associated with mental and emotional health benefits, relief from clinical depression, decreased anxiety and stress levels, enhanced relaxation, improved sense of emotional well-being. AIDS patients living with pets are less depressed. Pet owners have lower cholesterol levels, sleep more soundly, exercise more, and take fewer sick days than non-pet owners. In nursing homes, the presence of a dog is associated with a reduced need for medication, improved physical functioning, and improve vital signs even when the patients are suffering from dementia. The presence of a friendly dog is linked to a decrease in blood pressure in children and in adults under stress. And lastly, talking to a pet rather than a person was associated with a lower heart rate. And this is actually only a, um, uh, a small fraction of, uh, of the papers that have been published too. But there's a big but here and that is the research that shows the other view. These are two pieces that just came out recently, they're both January of 2011, um, and one is, of course, from the Washington Post, pets can improve mood, mood but evidence is thin that they can improve health. And then uh, a New York Times uh, opinion piece by another friend of mine, Hal Herzog, uh, Fido's no doctor, neither is Whiskers. Well, what does this all mean? This is a study where the uh, authors set out to reconsider, just the way they titled the paper here, uh, reconsider the relationship between pet ownership and health-related outcomes. And this is, when, this is in the elderly. And the only summary I need to give you here is pet ownership was not related to self-reported or general health. This is a larger study done in 2006 where a comparison was done uh, uh, to look at the associations of pet ownership with perceived health and disease indicators. And here's what they found. Good health was reported by 80% of pet owners and 82% of non-pet owners. Poor perceived health was reported in 4% of both groups. In perceived health, dog owners did not differ from those not owning one. And pet owners were more likely than non-pet owners to suffer from sciatica, kidney disease, arthritis, migraines, panic attacks, high blood pressure, and depression. Okay. So the conclusion from this paper was that pet ownership was associated with slightly poorer rather than improved perceived health. So now we've got evidence opposing what we thought was all good. And just to give you some more um, of what's come out since, a study of people with chronic fatigue syndrome found that while pet owners believed that interacting with their pets relieved their symptoms, objective analysis revealed that they were just as tired, stressed, worried, and unhappy as sufferers in a control group who had no pets. 
A 2000 Australian study of mortality rates found no evidence that pet owners lived any longer than anyone else. Dutch researchers concluded that companion animals had no effect on their owner's physical or mental well-being. Research published in a Scandinavian psychiatric journal followed 424 patients admitted to the hospital with acute coronary syndrome and found that cat owners were more likely to be readmitted or die within a year than patients who did not have a cat. Bad for cats. Cross-sectional surveys have not indicated association of pet ownership with cardiovascular health benefits per se. And a 2006 survey of Americans by the Pew Research Center reported that living with a pet did not make people happier. And this is their data. You can see that on the left is the happiness level. It's the percentage of people who scored themselves as very happy. And with um, the happiness level um, of no pet, 33%. With any pet, 35, dog owners, 35, and cat owners, 36. So not a very impressive study as far as what pets seem to do for us. So if you look at the evidence then of do pets help human health, we basically have now kind of equally weighted arguments on both sides. There's no denying there, there is benefits. But as far as sifting through when it is beneficial and to whom, under what circumstances, it's just not that clear cut. So let's then look at service or assistance animals because they do a lot of good for people. And the first question is, what is an assistance animal? What is a service animal? And that is this. Any animal that's, in, that's individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of a person with a disability, and Linda will talk more about this. Just a brief run through of some of the uses um, for service animals. Uh, there are diabetes assist dogs that are trained to sniff for a specific scent on the human breath that's related to a low or rapidly dropping uh, blood sugar levels. They're trained to alert the person by touching them in a significant way, such as pawing at them, licking at the face, nudging a hand, and can also be taught to retrieve juice or a snack, get an emergency phone, or get help from another person in the house. So they're of tremendous use for people with diabetes, especially um, not well-regulated uh, diabetics. This you'll hear a lot more um, in the next talk, too, and this is the Autism Assist Dogs. Uh, just real briefly, trained to provide safety, a calming influence, and peace of mind for these children and their families. When in public, the dogs are tethered, uh, uh, or the children are tethered to the dog for safety. If the child bolts away suddenly, the dog's trained to lay down and hold the position, and therefore the child is much more secure and close by. And this puts the mothers and fathers at a lot of peace of mind, uh, just that nothing dangerous can happen. There are, as I'm sure you all know, seizure alert and assist dogs. They're trained to sense an impending seizure and bark an alert. Uh, they also help people during and after they've had a seizure. The dogs stay with the person and they lick their face to comfort them while they recover from their seizure. They can be trained to bring an emergency phone or get help from another person. And the dog wears a backpack with pockets that can hold medicine and alert information in case the person's unable to communicate with others that come to help. There are also monkeys trained. This is a bit more controversial in terms of um, whether it's all good. Um, but there's a group called Helping Hands which trains monkeys uh, to assist the disabled. Uh, they're trained to facilitate a number of things like getting a drink of water. Uh, the one monkey up here um, is opening a jar of peanut butter. Um, uh, picking up dropped or out of reach objects, turning pages of a book, assisting with a phone or computer washing faces, that kind of a thing. So they actually do um, or can do quite a bit of uh, things. And they're psychiatric assist animals. They lessen anxieties, facilitate social interaction, encourage activity and involvement, promote independent self-care and general well-being, and they're beneficial for a variety of psychiatric conditions. I picked one just to illustrate, and that's the PTSD service dog. They uh, tend to do a lot for um, the um, retired soldiers, calming anxieties uh, before the anxieties become full-blown panic attacks, and they also can wake people from nightmares uh, by licking their face. So if you look at the benefits with the no benefits there, 
This one actually wins out hugely on the side of benefits. There's very little to be said in terms of no benefits. Um, so this one actually has tremendous benefits for people. So let's look at the last one then now, uh, animal-assisted interventions. First of all, the animal-assisted activities, and what these are, are they're basically the meet-and-greet type activities where pets are taken to various places and they just meet and greet the people. Some of the key features here are that these animals are not trained for specific duties. They're usually owner animals uh, certified for health and behavior by their owners. I had a lot of them when I was in private practice come to me for the health exam and the certification to go on and become therapy dogs. And these are just normal people, just good-hearted people that want to use their good-hearted pets to help people in hospitals. And Linda will talk more about that. The same activity can be repeated with many people, unlike therapy programs, which are uh, tailored to a particular person or medical condition. There's no specific treatment goals with this kind of activity uh, and also no records kept in terms of uh, a person's improvement. And the visiting is fairly spontaneous and they last short, long, whatever the particular person responds to um, or if it's in the facility, whatever the group of people uh, tend to respond to. Some examples of animal-assisted activities, a group of volunteers take their dogs and cats to a nursing home once a month to visit. The visit occurs as a large group activity with some direction and assistance provided by the, uh, the facility staff. An individual brings her dog to a children's long-term care facility to interact and play with residents. A dog obedience club gives a demonstration of obedience to a residential facility for teenagers with delinquent behavior. And at Best Friends, we have a number of groups that come to us. Um, we have a boarding school for kids with emotional behavior problems come to us twice a week, an alcohol and drug treatment center um, once a week, and a youth residential treatment center in St. George. Um, and what they end up uh, doing most of is what the two top pictures show, and that is working with training dogs um, and they get a lot of discipline that way, and they get a lot of good interaction with the dogs. But they also work with our other animals, too, and they um, certainly seem to enjoy and uh, benefit from it. Now, that was animal-assisted activity. This is animal-assisted therapy, which is a bit different. This is the deliberate inclusion of an animal in a treatment plan. The introduction of the animal is designed to accomplish predefined outcomes believed to be difficult to achieve otherwise, or outcomes best addressed through exposure to an animal. And the key features of this one, uh, as opposed to activities themselves, the individual treatment is designed specifically for each patient. There are specific goals for each treatment. Progress is monitored by notes taken at each session. And the visit uh, is scheduled and the length of visit is predetermined to best fit the needs of the patient. So this is a much more structured protocol, and it's actually to bring uh, people from a particular condition to an improved condition, as opposed to activities which tend to just support them uh, uh, with uh, friendliness and moral support, things like that. And the goals of the animal-assisted therapy uh, break down into three major groups. Physical, there are things like improve muscle strength and fine motor skills, improve wheelchair skills, and improve standing balance. Mental health, increase attention skills, increase self-esteem, reduce anxiety, and reduce loneliness. Um, this is a good illustration, by the way, of the overlap because, as I told you, the PTSD service dogs also reduce anxiety in the people who use them. And so it's not necessarily a therapy program, but both of these do have um, uh, beneficial effects in that way. And there's also motivational uh, benefits, um, improved desire to be part of group activity. It tends to draw uh, individuals in who are reluctant to interrelate with others uh, when the animals are there, uh, improve interactions with others, and increase exercise. This is just one uh, paper, animal-assisted therapy in patients hospitalized with heart uh, failure. And the conclusions here, animal-assisted therapy improves cardiopulmonary pressures, neurohormone levels, and anxiety in patients hospitalized with heart failure. Now, there's been a lot of interest in this um, in terms of its benefits, and a very, very broad study, um, uh, which was a meta-analysis, looked at 250 published reports of animal-assisted therapy. Of that, 49 met the criteria that the researchers here were using to look at the benefits of animal-assisted therapy 
And this is what they found after looking at all the reports, and this was, of course, published in 2007. Overall, animal-assisted therapy was associated with improved outcomes in four areas, autism spectrum symptoms, medical difficulties, behavioral problems, and emotional well-being. Dogs have a greater chance of being effective compared with other animals. Not a big surprise. And they found that the uh, animal-assisted therapy literature contains very little theory aimed at explaining the mechanisms by how this hall works. Um, the papers obviously report effects or no effects, um, but it's, there's very little known, and that includes to today, um, exactly the mechanisms that are involved in why animal-assisted therapy does what it does. The results from this meta-analysis support the long-held impression that animals can help in the healing process. Positive, positive, moderately strong findings were observed across medical well-being and behavioral outcomes as well as for reducing autism spectrum symptoms. Taken together, these findings suggest animal-assisted therapy as a robust intervention worthy of further use and investigation. This was just in the news like three days ago, and I just pulled it off um, just to show uh, some of the variety of, uh, uh, of therapy dogs. This just happens to be one that eases the anxiety for people going through MRIs. And you can also see the popularity and benefits of this by the number of books that are published on it. Um, these are eight books. Um, the one in the upper left is a text that's in its third edition. And all the other ones, this one's specifically autism, um, but the other ones are general. This is the role of animal companions in the healing processes and therapeutic processes. Um, and so there's a lot written on this now. But there is some evidence to point the opposite direction in terms of the benefits. Um, on that same meta-analysis I just showed you, they also found this. Young children consistently benefited across all outcome variables, but the other age groups were less consistent in the degree to which they benefited from animal-assisted therapy. So, in other words, it's not a 100% benefit every time it's tried for everybody. And as far as why it works for some people and not others, we don't know. Um, these researchers speculated that children just seem to be more responsive to animals, and that uh, certainly would fit common sense. This is another uh, uh, group of uh, researchers, neuroscientists at Emory University in Atlanta um, that have taken aim at the use of dolphins for animal-assisted therapy. Mainly, um, what they've shown is that there's basically no proven benefits, and the reason they've undertaken it is that they are dolphin-oriented themselves and don't want the dolphins hurt, um, and so they want to make sure that things are done only if they're needed and unfortunately, the evidence is not only thin, it's pretty much non-existent that this has the benefits that some claim it does. But if we look at the benefits and no benefits, um, the uh, weighing here is very strongly in, in, uh, on the side of benefits to people um, as opposed to the evidence for no benefits. Now, there's a caveat here, and that is something that your common sense would tell you, and that is that the positive impacts are pretty much limited to people who have positive feelings about the animals. And this, uh, again, kind of common sense. You don't just stick a dog in a house and say that that heart patient's going to recover faster because there happens to be a four-legged dog running around. Um, it, there's got to be positive feelings about the animals. And, of course, that weighs into whatever neural mechanisms are contributing to the benefits, too. Uh, was it Nancy? Somebody, I think, mentioned this. Um, and this is uh, Leo, uh, one of the Vic dogs. This is Leo. Leo didn't come to us. He's not one of the 22 we got. But Leo did become a therapy dog, and he's um, been doing a lot of good um, for a lot of people, just visiting a lot of places. Um, but it just shows you um, what kind of dogs uh, can become uh, very beneficial therapy dogs. Okay. So let's change the direction of the benefits now and look at how animals benefit from humans as opposed to how humans benefit from animals. And this is pretty obvious from the standpoint of pet ownership. You look at what, how they benefit. They get a home. They get food, social companionship, safety and security, mental stimulation, play, bathing and grooming, medical care, and just plain fun. So they benefit hugely in that sense, and I think everybody's quite aware of that, 
But I want to talk more about what science has shown us about the benefits um, uh, that animals get from people. This is a study that shows that horses petted by a person showed such a dramatic decrease in heart rate that the heart uh, was scoring skipped beats. Um, that's how uh, bradycardic it would become. This is a study where in, um, in rats, uh, the, both the thyroid and parathyroid glands were removed, and the rats were divided into two groups. One of the rats uh, received uh, petting and gentle handling every day, every day. The other group just received standard lab care, which is basically just cleaning cages and things like that. And look at uh, what happened here. The post-operative post deaths um, from those not handled uh, or just handled by lab, uh, by lab procedures, 79% of them died, whereas the ones that were handled gently, 12% of them. So there was a monstrous effect there in terms of the human interaction and the gentling that uh, was done. This is another study um, on rabbits uh, where rabbits were fed a high cholesterol diet and divided into two groups. One of them, similar to the last study, were, received normal lab care. The other group received uh, or were held, petted, talked to, and played with several times a day. And when they did autopsies or necropsies, what we call them, um, the, uh, the atherosclerotic lesions in the handled group were less than 50% as severe as the lesions in the non-handled group. So in some way, the human contact and the kindness and the gentling um, actually tremendously slowed the progression of a particular medical condition. In dogs, it's shown that contact with human beings can cause a large physiologic response. There's a study uh, where dogs were placed alone in a room and a person entered the room. And what happened with the heart rate is that on entry, and this is no surprise, the heart rate jumped up, a little bit of a surprise um, in terms of the person entering the room. But then what happened is the person would go over and pet the dog, and within one to two seconds of that physical contact, the heart rate would drop back down again. Pretty dramatic. Um, that's Ann Allums, one of our trainers, and uh, that's Merrill, one of the Michael Vick dogs. Further studies uh, showed that in addition to the heart rate changes, human contact could elicit major changes in the dog's blood pressure and the aortic and cardiac blood flow. The results showed that human contact such pro caused such profound increases in coronary blood flow that even the researchers were surprised, and they wrote in their report, in some, case, in some dogs, the person was almost as potent a stimulus to cardiac blood flow as heart exercise. Research showed that a uh, human being by simple touch could greatly reduce and even eliminate the fear and pain responses in dogs. In studies where dogs were given a shock and simultaneously petted by a person, the usual heart rate increase that would accompany an electric shock was significantly reduced in the dogs that were petted as, com as compared to the dogs that were shocked and not petted. Um, that's Mackenzie, one of our caregivers, and that's Little Red, another one of Michael Vick's dogs. All right, so balancing the welfare between the species then would seem to be something that we should pay attention to. And obviously we've got two parties involved here. We've got the human on one side and the animal on the other. Well, it's important, um, and I think Nancy mentioned this, that um, the animals have um, physical and emotional needs. And I, I emphasize the emotional because that's what not many people give a lot of attention to, but it's tremendously important and I just put one example here. Assistance dogs, dogs uh, being very highly social animals, require care uh, in, in all forms, emotional too, social companionship and affection. But the effect of participation in the animal assistance intervention programs on companion animals has been under-researched. The heavy bias in research is focusing on the human welfare side of these programs with minimal focus assessing the effects on the animals. And just as an example of why we should be concerned about this, there's a 2010 study of animal-assisted interventions where 25% of the respondents reported occasional negative effects on the animals involved, and the problems included various forms of animal neglect, animal abuse, aggression toward the animals, stress signals by the animals, and hiding and running away from the human clients. This is a paper written on the behavioral and welfare effects 
in uh, the dogs that help children with autism. And there's a few key passages here. The welfare of the individual dog may at times compete with the needs of the program. The human benefit associated with this type of service dog is substantial. Hence, potential exists in these service dog applications for canine welfare to be overshadowed by the needs of the family. Consideration of a service animal's health and welfare is an important ethical issue that must not be overlooked in animal assistance therapy or service dog placements. Well, why is the animal's welfare, why, why is that animal's welfare important? Well, there's an obvious answer, and that is for the animal's sake. The less obvious one is for the person's sake. For the animal's sake, you don't need to spend a lot of time on this, what happens if the animal isn't a good fit, is unhappy or stressed, or is not liked or is even resented by the person? And I just put a picture here just to illustrate, obviously, the emotional suffering that can go along with that kind of a situation. But what about the person's sake? This is where it gets a little interesting. When the well-being of the animal isn't good, the animal's ability to provide the desired service that the animal's there for diminishes. Diminished welfare of the animal also increases the risk of health or behavioral problems in the animal, which can put family members at risk, for example, of being bit. And undesirable behavior caused by diminished well-being can have a significant impact on client and pa or parent satisfaction, which threatens the dog's long-term placement in the family, which means that they may give up the dog sooner than they needed to if they'd just been paying attention to the dog's well-being and tended to it. So the dog, you know, ends up worse off and the people do too. Well, what are the animal assistance groups doing to safeguard the animal's well-being? This is uh, Assistance Dogs Europe, and I drew this off their website just because they have such an extensive list of things that they do to pay attention to the dog's welfare, but I'm only going to give you two. Um, one is an assistance dog must only be placed with a student able to provide for the dog's emotional, physical, and financial needs. And the other one that's applicable for my point I'm making is an assistant dog must only be placed with a student able to provide a stable and secure living environment. Now, there's some other groups um, that I got some uh, words of wisdom from because I went on the Internet and I also contacted many of these groups individually and asked them, what do you do to safeguard the well-being of the animals? Can Do Canines, um, which works with uh, assistance dogs, um, uh, is, uh, this is off their website, is dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for people with disabilities by creating mutually beneficial partnerships with specially trained dogs. So they're obviously cognizant uh, and tending to that. Reading Education Assistance Dogs, READ, which is part of Intermountain Therapy, um, this is off their website, and I particularly like this one. We wouldn't make any dog do this if he weren't having fun too. It's one of our most serious obligations as the two-legged partner on the team to make sure our animals are not forced to participate if they don't enjoy the interaction. The animals are not tools or machines, but individuals with their own needs and preferences, and we honor that at every turn. And there's another but. The question then is, and, and, and I should back up and say that when I spoke to a lot of uh, the groups on the phone, um, they didn't have anything real specific, but they, a lot of them told me that we paid very close attention to the animal's quality of life. Um, because we know the animals well and we know when things are not going well and therefore we can jump in and do something. Well, this is part of my research and that is how good at we, are we at assessing animals' quality of life? And just a brief look um, at a, uh, uh, drawn from the human literature, if you look at quality of life evaluations in people and compare the parent's evaluation as a proxy evaluator with their own child's self-evaluation of quality of life, we find that, I should say they, find that there's very poor agreement between the child and parents on measures of private experiences such as emotions, subjective states, and regardless of whether the child is healthy or sick. And so, of course, the, the moral to that story is that if, if parent-child proxy quality of life assessment is not that accurate, then how can our assessment of animals' quality of life be any better than that? So when groups are claiming that they're watching quality of life, I love hearing it, but the problem is is that without specifics, and we unfortunately we don't have all the specifics yet, 
we can't really tell. And some very interesting things come up in private practice as a veterinarian that um, elucidate this, and that is that very often we'll see patients come in with medical issues, and the most common one is real bad teeth, with the infected and loose teeth. And we'll tell the person, look, we really need to bring your dog or cat in and, and do some work on the mouth and make your dog or cat feel better. And there's a lot of skeptics out there, I'm sure you all know about these people, that just, you know, think every recommendation is to make money for yourself. And so they'll say, ah, come on, doc, that, you know, he doesn't need that. He eats fine. He acts fine, everything. So very often then you'll finally twist their arm to go along with it, and the dog will go home. Two weeks later they'll call you back and say, I cannot believe it. He's like a puppy again. And, of course, what was happening is the slow decline in the animal's responsiveness and, and, and activity was not noticed. It was too gradual. It just wasn't picked up. But as soon as you do something to correct it, everything is tremendously looking good again. And we see this in veterinary medicine quite a bit with things like hypothyroidism, where people just attribute the slowing to aging, things like that. And we, give them, uh, we find that their thyroid's not working, give them supplementation. And once again, you know, if it's a dog, you get the call. It's like a puppy again. And the, and the last real common one is arthritis. Um, aging dogs get arthritis very commonly, and people just attribute it to my dog slowing down. He's getting old. You know, that's what do dogs do. And so we've got a lot of drugs in veterinary medicine that are working really well in these dogs, and so now we can say, why don't you give it a try? And they call back two weeks later and say he's like a puppy again. So it's always like a puppy again. So while we have um, developed numerous instruments for measuring animal well-being, welfare, quality of life, our accuracy is still far from where we want it and need it to be. So this balance of welfare, what does and should this balance look like? Well, you can look at it in very obvious graphic ways here. Um, one is that the human benefits outweigh the animals. And that's the way many animals are cared for in these days. The other is the loonies on my area of the welfare movement. Um, and that's the ones that put the animal's interest far above the human interest. And then there's loonies, no matter where they are, that weigh things like this and basically look at the human benefits are all that matters no matter what. And then there's the benefit that we find at Best Friends, and I personally think is the appropriate one, and that's the even balance between human and animal in terms of who gets what benefits and, and, um, and the welfare concerns. So how do we achieve this balance? Well, I put together, drawing from some of the other things that I mentioned earlier, some guidelines that will assure this balance be paid attention to and tended to. One, uh, on these guidelines, um, the animal's well-being and enjoyment of life must be a top priority of the animal's primary caregiver. Any training must utilize humane methods providing for the physical and emotional safety of the animal. Three, and this comes from the, animal assist, or the assistance dogs Europe, an assistance dog must only be placed with a person or family able to provide for the animal's physical, emotional, and social needs. This also was the other one from assistance dogs, an assistance to animal must only be placed with a person or family able to provide a stable and secure living environment. Groups placing the animals should provide recipients with a clear list of signs to watch for that might indicate the animal's well-being is impaired. This is difficult for the very reason I just showed you. When people ask me to provide them with a clear sign, because we make decisions in veterinary medicine of when quality of life declines to where, sadly, death is a better option and we can elect euthanasia, um, people want uh, very clear-cut signs from me. And I'm one of the guys that researches and writes and lectures about this, and I still can't give absolute clear-cut uh, signs. The therapy animal must never be forced to perform, uh, work or perform actions that's, that he or she is reluctant to perform. Animals are to be given suitable rest and quiet periods between sessions. Efforts should be made to enhance the animal's quality of life above and beyond the simple absence of suffering, that is, to a level of reasonable enjoyment of life rather than simply an adequate quality of life. Pleasurable, engaging, and fun activities should be offered on a daily basis. And lastly, provisions must be in place to ensure the welfare of any assistance animal in the event of the death or inability to provide good care 
to the animal. This is what you don't do. So getting this balance right, what does it look like in real life? So that's it. Um, and um, I'll uh, leave the stage now. Um, if there's any questions, we agreed to um, combine uh, Linda and myself afterwards. Um, I, I don't know if we'll do it here or outside, but um, so I'm happy to answer any questions um, later. Thank you. This is one of those quality of life issues. Their nails are sliding on the stage, so they're a little nervous. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Linda Weiskopf. Most of you know me already as Donnie's mom because so many of you have met Donnie in the last couple of days. So I'm not offended at all that you remember his name and not mine. Um, in, a, in a minute, I'll introduce the other folks up here that are go going to help me. But... Um, I'm a volunteer puppy raiser for Canine Companions for Independence, as is my husband here, David Weiskopf. And the two other folks I have here, Kate Anderson, um, she owns an organization called Autism Journey, and she actually has received a dog from Canine Companions for Independence, and that dog is, we refer to, uh, well, her name is Gammy. <laughs> we refer to her as a facility dog. And part of what I'm hoping to do in the next 30 minutes is help you understand um, some of the things that Dr. McMillan touched on, but the difference between these dogs and how a facility dog could actually help many of you in, in uh, your health care practices. And then on the end here, I have um, Sawyer and his dog, Hal, and his mom, Candace. I always wonder why I introduce his dog before I introduce his mom, but... Uh, <laughs> And I'm going to ask each one of them to help um, to just spend five minutes so that I wouldn't have to talk the whole time um, to explain to you um, how the dogs work in their organizations. Um, before I do that, I have a short um, nine-minute video. Please don't fall asleep. But it shows the dogs in action from um, Canine Companions for Independence. and It will give you a better idea how the dogs actually work in these different roles. I will tell you it's a shameless promotion for Canine Companions for Independence, but um, that's why the video was produced, so I, I use it often, and I hope you will enjoy it. Go ahead with the video.
film that it's supposed to work there is in the movie that it's not in the big computer. Help me figure out the name. With us, you know, if you're born in Tyre, then you can tell me where to dance and then you don't want to go. And if you can take me there to see that and I'll go. And if you have something to do there, do it. If you're in, do it. To take the work out of the work and to make it a, a wonderful experience, regardless of whether or not the goal says to want to experience it with children and with their the parents. At the end of Sheila's working day, she goes home with her caretaker, Libby Town. Libby's remarks she will live a wonderful home and lots of CRP without question. CPI is the program that we want to work with. So that's the journey of a hero. It's one requiring hard work, dedicated fuel, sacrifice, and commitment. Ultimately, it was all about what only a girl can do. Unqualified love, uncompromising loyalty. There are a lot of heroes in the movie. Puppy raisers, volunteers, and sugar babies. Won't you be one? We promise you a rewarding journey. Thank you, CPI, for providing this film. And to Libby for the wonderful work that you did for me. Thank you, CPI, for everything that you do and for seeing me so many lives and so many babies. On behalf of the children, the staff, Where, where else would you have your guest speakers sit on the floor? I mean, <laughs> one of the things you need to know about these dogs is they're not allowed, as we're raising them as puppies, um, to sit on the furniture in the home. And so we all get very used to sitting on the floor with them because um, we want to be with them too. So I, I just loved it. I didn't set it up very well so they could watch the video, and they all just plopped down on the floor. So. Um, and I'm not bringing my pup up again because he's 13 months old and he's developed some issues around stairs and slick surfaces and we're working through those. We use treats to try and encourage him to come up the stairs, but I just don't want to test him again in a large room like this. So um, I think at this, this would be a good time. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to let Kate um, talk for a few minutes about her facility dog Gammy and um, explain one of the, some of the things that she does at Autism Journeys. And I, I should also add, not only did I ask my guests to sit on the floor, um, Kate came up here from Lehigh and Candace and Sawyer came up here from Spanish Fork. So they came a long way to do this presentation for you today. Kate, I'll turn the time over to you. Hi, my name is Kate Anderson. I'm the founder of Autism Journeys in just barely in Lehigh, right over the point of the mountain. And at Autism Journeys, we do a variety of intervention methods. So obviously we work with individuals on the spectrum, but that includes behavioral interventions, occupational therapy, speech pathology, psychology, clinical therapy, psychiatry. So we were looking for an animal who could really come into the center and help in a variety of different ways. And I have a quick little PowerPoint, mainly just with some pictures so that you can see some of the things that she does. But I think one of the biggest differences, and for many of you being um, professionals in the medical field and having your own practice, really is just the atmosphere that Gammy is able to provide and the change that she has provided in the center. No offense to all of the hospitals and doctor's offices, but we strive really hard to not appear like a typical doctor's office. We really wanted our patients and clients to feel very comfortable, and nothing screams comfort more than a dog greeting you when you walk in the door. Um, and a dog who knows what animals, or, or excuse me, well, all animals, what what individuals would like to be greeted and what individuals are maybe more hesitant and aren't interested in being greeted. So here's the 
Um, we do a variety of different things. This is just showing GAMI really working on friendship and allowing another individual to be with them. Um, this child wasn't ready yet to have a friend on the swing, um, but, but GAMI, okay, they're fine with that. Oh, let's go back. Love and affection, um, many individuals on the spectrum struggle with those intense emotions and that contact. But what I have found is they're far more, many of them are far more receptive to receiving that from an animal. So they may come in my office and they're not ready to look me in the eye or talk to me and they don't want me to touch them. But GAMI is a whole nother story and there's a real unspoken bond between GAMI and a lot of our clients. So this little kiddo happened to be working on some very difficult things in a session and his reward is to come into my office and get GAMI and get some loves and go play fetch. So fetch is a great turn taking activity too. She's a snack helper. She sets a really good example. We have a lot of um, opportunities. We have a little preschool there where the kids are asked to take on different jobs and do different things and change can be very difficult for a lot of my clients. So watching GAMI rotate through the helper list is really encouraging and many of them are, oh, well GAMI was snack helper yesterday. I get to be snack helper today. And we have all their pictures up in the preschool room and GAMI has her own little student picture as well and she's a very large part of the group. Um, not to mention it's just cute. Um, Finger painting and encouraging tactile um, touches, it's a big deal, it's a big deal. <laughs> you know, touching things, putting your hands in things, trying Play-Doh, doing finger painting. Um, we're not a center that pushes our children to do things before they're ready. Um, we also work with adults as well. Um, but if we can motivate them and give them encouragement and show them that it's okay and it's fun and it can feel good, or at least that it can be tolerated, um, Gammy, Gammy does a lot for that, and the kids get a really big kick out of that. Um, she also helps really well with washing your hands afterward, because Gammy obviously has to go through all of the grooming afterwards as well. Calm, deep pressure. Do we have any dentists in here? Yeah, or dentists, orthodontists. This is actually Gammy with my son. My oldest son has DeGeorge syndrome and a variety of other developmental delays and was very, very nervous and anxious at the dentist's office, as many of us are. And in the past, he always needed um, either sedation or, you know, a lap pad, something to help calm him. When we got GAMI, um, this was really one of the first times I tried it out with my own son. They get to be the guinea pigs. And GAMI laid on him, providing him that deep pressure input and my son went through the entire dental experience without any medication. And as you can see, Gammy's very interested. She's very into it. If you look really close, you can see that Jordan has his hands like right in Gammy's fur. And, and Gammy enjoyed it as well. She was really into all the different smells that come from the dentist's office. <laughs> so she's consequently been back multiple times for my dentist's other patients who um, they found they wanted her around for. Setting an example, staying with the group, um, it's also a very, very big deal. Being able to sit close to another person, stay with each other, pay attention to the person that is speaking, that's a big deal. This little gal really struggles to sit and hold still, the gal in the pink. And with Gammy, in this shot she's not doing it, but often she's rubbing Gammy and just getting a lot of comfort from that as well. We also do a lot of this, um, just having Gammy in the area of the clients when um, our psychologist is presenting a family with a new diagnosis. So that's a devastating thing to be, um, to be experiencing in that, in that time. And somehow when your child's on the floor being licked and laughing while you're receiving that diagnosis, it's a great reminder that your child is still your child and they're still amazing and enjoyable and happy. Uh, friendship and support, this little gal, uh, she wanted nothing to do with me for two years, two years, nothing to do with me. I got Gammy and all of a sudden you would have thought I was Santa Claus. So what we've done with her is really encourage her social interactions through Gammy. We take her to the gas station. We take, um, her name happens to be Jordan as well. We take her all out in the community and the, the deal is if you want Gammy with you, 
you have to interact with other people, meaning you're the GAMI expert. So when people ask you what her name is and how old she is and all of that, this little gal is responsible for that. And that's giving her a real sense of purpose and it's also really increased her social interactions and her confidence has really gone up. Eye contact, that kind of goes without saying in the autism community. Um, that's a big, that's just a big deal. One of the reasons that I think CCI paired me with GAMI is GAMI happens to be one of those dogs that really seeks that eye contact. And um, again, often at the center, I'll go all day long and not receive a whole lot of eye contact. But believe me, GAMI gets it a lot. So that's usually my bridge to get in there. <laughs> Patience, um, waiting for her birthday cake. Uh, that's a specially made dog cake for all you CCI people. I got special permission. Um, it, you know, it's fun. Celebrations, getting together, feeling excited. She's a big motivator. She holds the book a lot for story time. Um, kids aren't interested in the story, but man, when the dog is holding the, uh, the book, all of a sudden things become far more interesting. I know I pay far more attention when she's holding the book. Uh, building relationships, this little gal was just giving Gammy a present and she's really wanted to interact with her for a while, but she's shy and um, just, you know, working on things. Gammy does all of the standard commands that many of the um, other CCI dogs do as well, but in my center her job is not so much to turn the lights on and off and open the doors, although she can do those things, and she does, but her job is really more to provide motivation and comfort and unconditional love and support and just an overall sense of understanding and warmth to the environment. Celebration, there she is with a bunch of kids. You can see they're all, this happens to be Gammy's birthday. One standing is my other older son. <laughs> they're all very, um, you know, very engaged, very interested and uh, excited and in a big group, which that's not easy to do at my center. Taking a break, it's really important for us to recognize that they are at work. Uh, Gammy's funny, if I don't go to work for a few days, she will bring over her vest to me, like, listen, I have a purpose, I'm supposed to be doing it, let's get me back at work. So I know that she enjoys her job, but one of the things I also know is that if Gammy ever goes in her kennel like this, she has a little bed by my desk, but then she also has this kennel, Gammy's telling me that she needs a break and she needs time away. So if she's with a child who maybe has been all over her and she's been very patient, you know what, when that child gets up and leaves the room or Gammy leaves the room and I find her in her kennel, that's her way of telling me that she needs a break and we're very careful to make sure that we respect that. Some days she needs more breaks than others. Uh, you know, she'll go a week without being in there sometimes. And then just providing them with love and family. This is my cute family. <laughs> and she's one of the family, and making sure that she can come home and be part of a big group is, is critical. So they do some amazing things. I think many of you would be really pleasantly surprised at how easy it is to incorporate the dogs into your practices and how many people are far more willing to come in and talk to you about emotional struggles or get those shots or go to the dentist, things like that. So that's it. Oh, sorry, Dan. <laughs> okay, first lesson. I, I'm never supposed to not hold on to the leash, but one of my fellow puppy raisers is assisting me here. I took it chance because we were in a closed room and so he's not going anywhere he's just visiting our other puppy sorry okay um i'd also like sawyer and his mom to come up do you want to leave hal there they're sure having a hard time with this floor no you, he, he's fine hal's hal's the old guy of the group so i have to tell you sawyer i met him five years ago when i had my first puppy in training and since that time, I only see Sawyer maybe once a year. He remembers and recites for me every dog that I've raised, knows their names, remembers their color, so he knows better than I do um, my history with the dogs. All right, we'll turn the time off. Hi, my name is Candace, and uh, we've been with the CCI organization. My son graduated with his dog, Hal. We graduated as a, a skilled companion team, and what that means is I am the facilitator. I facilitate the dog, and 
um, Sawyer is the recipient. So we graduated five and a half years ago. You'll notice Hal has a little bit of silver on his chin. That makes him look distinguished. And he's a spoiled rotten dog. He gets regular spa days where he gets his nails trimmed in his bath. And, and he's spoiled rotten. And he, he takes care of Sawyer. And Sawyer takes care of him. Um, you know you're a mother of a child with autism when he leans over and says, Mom, this lettuce is really crisp. That means it's been through osmosis. <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Maybe I didn't listen in school. I don't know. Anyways, uh, I have five children, and both of my boys have autism spectrum disorders, so I became, by assignment, an ASD mom. That's what we call ourselves sometimes. Uh, I went through all those kind of fun things, like the feces smearing and the head banging and the running away. Uh, you wouldn't know it looking at Sawyer now, but when he could crawl out of a crib at 10 months. At two years old, he climbed up on the kitchen table, opened the window, pushed the screen out, and ran away. And he was usually naked. So uh, we've been through some really interesting stuff over the years with my boys and um, with the rest of our family supporting uh, what we do as a family to make our boys have a successful life and help them to expand their horizons. Um, I love the variety that autism brings to our house, and I'm continually amazed at the intelligence and the determination that Sawyer shows. Um, we try to nurture their needs, which means not stress them out when they get anxious about certain situations, but also we like to push their limits. Uh, we take Hal with us when we go to Moab, uh, when we go on backpacking trips, when we go to Disneyland. Um, he's right there by Sawyer's side, helping him to feel calmer so he doesn't get nervous with all those people and different situations. This is something we couldn't do before we got Hal when Sawyer was eight years old. Uh, Sawyer also didn't sleep in a bed. He finally potty trained at six years old, and he didn't sleep in a bed until we got Hal. And now they both sleep right there, side by side, each on a pillow in the bed. And I say to my husband, have you checked on the boys? And we go in there, and there they are both snoring loudly. <laughs> and... Um, I would go to the end of the earth for my son, but it turned out that I only needed to go to Oceanside, California to get this awesome dog and help him, help Sawyer have a successful life. And I'm going to let Sawyer tell you a few things in his own words. Okay, sorry if this doesn't like really make sense to you because I'm not used to speaking to this many people. But as you can tell, this is my dog, Hal. Um, having Hal has taught me responsibility because I feed him, I groom him, and especially take him for a walk. If you don't take him for a walk, he's really grumpy. Mm -hmm. And he com comforts me when I go to the dentist or hair stylist or whatever. They can be really scary. But he also helps me when we go to public places like here, the mall, the movies. And because of how I have been able to, I have the opportunities to talk about him to people and my communication has gotten better and I can actually stare people in the eye. Mm -hmm. And with him, I have become more confident and have achieved many goals such as being on student council at my junior high but best of all is if I'm having a bad day or I get bullied at school I can always come home to an unconditional friend like him I think one of the first times I met Sawyer, he spoke to just a group of us that were getting together for a training session, and there were five or six of us, and he was a little intimidated, so I don't think I ever thought that I would see Sawyer talking to a group this large, so nice job, Sawyer. Uh, so there's one other dog up here, you may have noticed. Um, Kara is our... Therapy, we call her therapy dog. Um, she, she actually works for Intermountain Therapy Animals. 
Kara started out in this organization for Canine Companions. Um, our goal for her was for her to graduate and be placed with someone. And then about five weeks after she went back to college, which is what I call the advanced training for these dogs, we got a phone call that Kara was being released. And so at first I cried, and then, of course, I was delighted in trying to figure out how we could get back there because that's one thing. When you raise these puppies, you get first choice to get them back. So Kara, Kara definitely was a delight for me. Um, sometimes I refer to it as Kara flunked out of college, and our, our local trainer gets very upset with me and says, no, she chose a different career. You know, maybe maybe she was studying this subject and decided to move over to this one. So Kara's our career change dog who now visits, um, as, as you heard Dr. McMillan talking about um, animal-assisted activities, Kara visits uh, nursing homes. She visits the hospitals in town. Uh, she goes to the Behavioral Institute. And um, at McKD, she um, twice a month, visits with the psychiatric um, intensive care unit and the orthopedic rehab. See, my husband didn't want to speak, but he'll stand up here and remind me of the things I'm forgetting to say. Um, yeah, we go to the pediatric unit in the hospital and the orthopedic rehab. Um, the, I guess stories to me are the best way to relate to you the kind of impact these dogs can have, but one of my favorite stories is that um, Kara was meeting with a woman in the psychiatric unit. Uh, she was in a catatonic state and was ready to be transferred to the state um, state hospital. And they asked me if I'd be willing to go in. And I said, of course. And I take all my cues from the therapist who's with me. And uh, we went into the room, which had been stripped of everything so this woman couldn't harm herself. And Kara sort of stood up on the bed and looked at the woman who was curled up in a fetal position, making no sound, um, no even acknowledgement that Kara was there. And Kara just decided to give this woman a face bath. We don't usually allow kissing unless the patient wants it, but this woman didn't even have a chance to say yes. And the two of them, the woman started giggling and reached out and grabbed her and <clears throat> still chokes me up to this day. The two of them spent the next five minutes loving and communicating in some kind of language that I didn't understand, but the therapists were very surprised to see her come out and have that kind of reaction with Kara. And then just recently at our assisted living um, place that we take Kara to every week, one of the Alzheimer's patients um, who dearly loves Kara uh, but never remembers her name. I can even walk to the other end of the room and come back and she'll say, oh, this is a beautiful dog. What's her name? <laughs> and we just go along with that. Well, one day my husband walked up to her with the dog and she looked up kind of startled and she said, oh, it's Kara. And then she stopped and she looked at my husband and said, I remembered her name. And it was, it was her family heard about that. I mean, everybody just loved that story. So um, many of you have talked to me over the last couple of days about the wonderful pets you have at home and wondered what you could do with your pets. And I am also trying to put in a plug for um, Intermountain Therapy Animals because if you have one of these wonderful pets, whether it be a bunny rabbit or a guinea pig or mostly dogs but some cats, um, they can become therapy animals. It, they go through a certification process, a testing and um, get certified to visit these places. We had to go through additional testing to, to be able to take her to the hospital, but now she's got her official little badge on there. So um, either afterward, if you'd like to speak to Kathy Klotz, who's got the nice um, Intermountain Therapy red shirt on there, or, um, she's oh, my husband would like Kathy to stand so that we know who you are. <laughs> I, I could tell she wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Kathy is the president of Intermountain Therapy Animals and can answer any questions. I also thought it might help in the short time that we have just to say 
therapyanimals.org, and you can get all the information on when the testing is, um, when there are opportunities for you perhaps to enter this field with your own, um, your own wonderful pets. So in summary, I mean, I'm just trying to give you, it is hard to do in such a short period of time, but some idea how possibly you could even use one of the canine companion dogs in a facility um, or perhaps you could recommend to some of your patients that they apply for a dog. Um, these dogs go to adults and children with physical disabilities, as you saw many of them um, in, in the video. They are free, free of charge to the people that get them. And I have met many people in grocery stores and stuff who've asked me about the dogs, and when I explain that they're free, they're they're overwhelmed because many of them are trying to save $30,000 to purchase one from other organizations that perhaps are not as large as Canine Companions. Um, and right now they are really pushing to try and get these dogs out to Iraqi and um, Afghanistan veterans. Um, they, they know that they can provide a service to those folks. And so we've a number of the dogs have been placed in um, healthcare facilities where they work with veterans. In fact, I talked to a couple of you about the possibility of applying for a facility dog and um, using them in, in that capacity as well. It, the, the one caveat is when you have a facility dog, it means that one person has to be that dog's caretaker um, and take them home at night just like they did in the video. Um, one other thing you could do is Feel free to ask any of us to do a follow-up presentation. If you have a group that gets together or you want more information, we would love to do that. And we always bring a dog, and I won't bring a dog up on a platform like this again. Um, and the last thing you can do, and I've had a few inquiries about this, and I'm a shameless promoter for this, but we always need puppy raisers. You know, here we are explaining the benefits of what these dogs can do for people, and unless we have more people raising the puppies, the waiting list becomes longer and longer. So I always feel like it's a, it's a mixed bag explaining what wonderful acts they can do and then not, um, not put in a plug for becoming a puppy raiser. And I'm happy to give you more information about that. Someone asked me, if I was a puppy raiser, what would I do when I got called to the OR? And I said, well, you just would put the dog in, in its kennel. Um, my husband takes our dogs to work, um, and, and he's a prosecutor, and uh, he even goes into the courtroom. But when they're younger, he puts them in um, a kennel, a collapsible crate, and they go to work with him and, you know, have their outings, and other people love to assist um, helping the dogs. So it, it doesn't mean that you give up your practice or can't do your regular work routine if you um, if you take the dog to work. And with that, oh, I'm supposed to put in one shameless plug. If you haven't heard, uh, we have a CCI golf tournament on August the 19th at Wasatch State Park, and there will be dogs on every tee um, at our one big year-round fundraiser. So if any of you happen to be interested in golfing, we have several brochures here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was just wonderful. And I hope that all of you can be, many of us can be puppy raisers or just have our own dog or animal to love. Uh, Dr. McMillan will be outside to sign his book personally or speak with you if you'd like. And I really would encourage you all to go to Angel Valley. You know, you didn't really, the place is so beautiful. It's 33,000 acres. Uh, the old westerns were, were shot there and it's, um, it is a magnificent place and you can get a wonderful vegetarian lunch there. And um, anyway, this was a fascinating talk, and thank you, all you people with big hearts. Book signing at front. <laughs>